wonderful, I like to call him our little American schoolboy. He's all dressed up in his dapper little short with his white collar and his straw bonnet. And he is a wonderful example of someone's ingenious use of materials and different stitching techniques and painting techniques. I'm going to take his hat off so you can see how his head is fully stitched. Look at those big cabbage ears. They are really cute. And then he is stitched down the back of his head and he has painted hair and when he comes around look at his profile again and see how this person has made use of of stitching with the little um, forelock curls here on the forehead to give definition to the face and the little stitch shaping of the nose not much of it um, and, or perhaps it has kind of like sunken in over time but it did have a little definition of the nose not just painting and then just the wonderfully pale blue painted eyes and his big thick brows and he's holding on to his own little doll, his own little um, Bruckner um, American cloth commercial doll in a sailor costume. And this chubby fellow, you'll see with a lot of these, the cloth dolls that were handmade, that they all tend to have these, I would call them very robust bodies. And it's almost like the family could not figure out how, the person making it in their home could not figure out how to make that very shapely body. So they would be really chubby. Um, here's one I'm showing you his hands so you can see how very plump his hands are as well as his torso and in this case they managed to cast his head casting upward which is very very nice it's got a very proud look to him he again has the black wool yarn sewn on cap and painted features of his eyes and pupils and brows and again wonderful definition of the painted teeth. So people use the different talents that they had to try to to bring out the personality of the doll. And I would like to imagine that this was some child's very, very favorite plaything in this wonderful red sailor jacket and little cotton pantalettes, which is quite a combination. But there it is, American cloth dolls came in just wonderful costume variations because they tended to be costumes in the cast-offs um, from earlier children in the family, sometimes sewn down to their right size and sometimes just charmingly oversized. And this is all part of their pleasure. We have here Grandma, and very definitely designed to be an older woman. Her very, very wiry gray hair made of um, a, like a really frizzy material. I don't know exactly what to call it. It kind of looks like a soap pad you'd use in the kitchen. I don't know if they had such a thing then, but just to give you an idea of what the material was like. And very, very simply made, although please look again, when I turn it to the side, you can see some definition of her face line. Very, very strong chin. Very well-defined chin and a little elongated neck, which is what makes her have the appearance of almost being an adult. Um, inked on, inked on facial features, very simply done and perhaps brighter at one time and now faded, but she's a very charming lady. This is another doll that I really did not know what category it would go in. Would it go in commercial makers or would it go into handmade? Uh, very difficult to tell. Very beautiful and elegant woman, almost looks like a governess or a nurse in the costume that she's wearing and a very absolutely flat dimensional face and she has, I want to pull the scarf back so you can see how she's made. This was a very, very common technique in the commercial makers. The faces were made separately and then they were stitched on to a fitted muslin back of head. So again, this one really puzzles me because she has, she has a feeling of being commercially made, but her painting is so individual and so absolutely artistic. I mean, whoever painted this, they could have been painting an oil painting for the wall because it is that finely done. Very, very subtle, blushing, beautiful eyes. Everything about her is fine. And she's holding her, which is part of, goes with her in the, in the collection, her own little um, Dolly Varden doll, which were charming little dolls that were truly, these were commercial, but they were made from bits and pieces left over. For example, look at her feet. Look at how these, these are just absolutely charming mismatched stockings. This is all part of the leg. This is the fabric that's on there. There's a shoe. Here's some star, star printed stockings and very, very different fabrics putting her together with just a flat printed face sewn on almost like a, um, just like a, a wrapped coil of cloth. 
And finally, my favorite of the homemade dolls. And more than any doll personifies the use of found materials in, in a family making a doll. I, you could own this doll and you could try to envision her history and, over and over, and you'll never know what it is because many of them just don't carry their history with them except that we can find clues in them. Now look at her doll, look at this doll. Let me point out to you, for example, she has the stockinette face and then she has cut out eye sockets, but what are in those eye sockets? Stitched around, not shoe buttons, but real glass eyes, which obviously had been taken from a broken bisque doll that someone else in the family had owned at some point, perhaps the wealthier child, perhaps this was the black servant who made this doll for their family and they took the broken bisque doll that precious little girl had um, broken and discarded and they took the parts of it because the rest of her body is so great. It is fabric material over, over old composition body parts from a German bisque doll. And that doll was so worn that even you can see the fingers had been broken off underneath this cotton they put over it. So whoever made this doll used all of the found materials they could have to make it. And what I really love, her costume, I want a home. Another whole category of homemade or folk art dolls were dolls that were made with oil painted features or complexion. And I've kind of separated those from the first group. Once again, um, I want you to realize that some of these I'm calling one of a kind folk art, but they might possibly be small groups of commercial dolls made. There has been so little research on American cloth dolls. It's one of our great lacking fields. I want to show you two books that have come out within the past few years that all of you should have in order to really uh, bring your learning forward. But there's so much still to be done and it's a, just a great study. The Blacklers have done a wonderful thing for all of us by having this collection available with so many dolls to see at one time. I wanted to show you this one first of all, partly because I think she's absolutely beautiful. Again, she's one of my favorites and I guess I should tell you that I really don't mind when they're worn and tattered at when they're folk art dolls because to me it bespeaks of the child's love for the doll and the play it had. So much pride went into owning this doll um, even though it might have been poor and simple. So look at it. This is a very common technique that was used in the making of these folk art dolls. You can see it's a flat dimensional face. You can see from the profile and you can see the seam where this piece of canvas was lying flat on a table originally and then was painted and then was sewn on to the muslin form of the doll. Um, we did many, many body shots for the catalog and if you have the catalog you'll see about 50 of the dolls We've actually shown their bodies in the back of the book so you can see the techniques that were used and so many, oh it's just, it's almost, it's amazing to look at them. Now this woman, despite her simple making and her tired state, she had a technique that was used very often where a, like a, a row of wig would be sewn to the top of the head so there wouldn't be much hair but it would be under a cap usually. In this case, what might have been an original cap is not there and instead the doll has its lovely straw bonnet. But then you get into the quality of the painting, of the oil painting. And here's where I want to talk, you're going to hear me say this over and over on these oil painted dolls. At this time in America, there were um, itinerant painters that would travel to small villages and towns all over America. This was either pre-photography or photography in its, in its early, early stages. And the way you could record a family member was an itinerant painter coming into town and painting your child, your mother, your father, and then framing it and putting it on a wall. These paintings are worth so much money today. And I am saying, why aren't we appreciating these oil painted cloth dolls in the same way? Because that's what they were. They were miniature oil paintings. Some are finer than others, some are downright fabulous artistry and others are, are very, very simple and just endearing, but not a great deal of talent to them. But we should be looking at these oil painted cloth dolls the same way we look at the oil painting from America from the same time period that's hanging over your fireplace on the wall. And to me, this is a lovely example of one. This doll, again, also has very, very endearing features. And one of the um, 
things I was able to do in working on these dolls was I was able, again, to see all of their head construction and to see how the, work, the, the makers of them tried to find different techniques to give the head shape or to give it strength. There would be, there, they might be seamed at the front and the back. They might be, have four seams at the side. They might have an extra, extra little uh, seam at the chin to give the chin definition. And again, we've noticed before the definition on the nose. This again, a very, very beautiful doll with what I would say anyone judging painting would not certainly not say it would be hanging um, in the Louvre, but it certainly would be hanging in a collection of fine American primitive folk art paintings. She's a very, very beautiful doll. Take a look at this little charmer. Talk about, now this is an oil painted face, oil painted on a piece of cloth and then put over the underneath form of the doll. Now usually those under, under the painting head forms are stuffed muslin, stuffed with old rags. Um, in this case, when we were cleaning her and putting her bonnet back on, we kept trying to stick the hat pin in because we want to make sure we don't lose these hats. And it wouldn't go in. You can even see the little dented pin on the top. And we said, why, why won't this go in? And then we realized the person, ingenious person who made this doll used like a wooden bedpost top, a wooden knob, and put their fabric painted face over this wooden form underneath. So this would be a wooden and cloth folk doll. And she has this really kind of endearing head tilted to the side look. So not only is her painting wonderful, but also her uh, posture of herself. And I'm gonna show you a couple other small ones. And one of the things I learned in doing this collection, how few small hand painted folk dolls they are. They all tended to be larger. And why? It would be very simple. This was easier for someone who was unskilled at making wonderful little artistry pieces to put together a larger doll. You saw those um, big fat bodies earlier and that would, it was simpler, simply simpler to make. And speaking of those bigger dolls, this is a wonderful example of one. Um, if you, I'm, I'm feeling her body underneath now and you can tell it's just, it's stuffed with old rags, which is what they would use in making these dolls. Found materials nearby at hand. Um, and finally when rags were used for every other purpose, then they could go into the making of the doll. You want to always look at their hands because different details of the hands. Sometimes uh, the fingers were nothing more than like a, a mitten, not even a defined thumb. Sometimes it would be a mitten with a defined thumb. Other times they actually had stitching on the fingers as this one to define them, and sometimes big separate fingers. So all of these uh, construction details went into the making of the doll. One of the things that happened starting about 1880s, various uh, fabric uh, pattern manufacturers started having patterns for making dolls. And that helped a lot of the parents who were making a doll in their home because then they could find out exactly what the techniques were. It also explains why there are many dolls that seem to be alike, but also seem to be homemade because they really were both. They were made from this pattern, but they were made in the home. I think this girl has wonderful painting on her face, albeit she doesn't have a whole lot of shape to her face, very, very um, block, not, no, really no definition of the chin at all, but this wonderful wig she has with the little braids, and they really complement her beautifully painted features. I'm gonna turn her around so you can see her wonderful wig. Uh, I'm sorry, her wonderful bonnet and the detail on it. And when she comes around again, look at how wonderfully detailed the eyes and the nose are, those very staring kind of eyes with great outline all around them. Very great doll. Okay, this girl has to be one of my favorites. When you talk about they didn't seem to be able to make a doll that would, could have a, um, a nice slender, well-shaped body. This is one plump girl, but she is so wonderful. She's all dressed up in her best, her finery. She has beautifully painted features and painted hair. You can see how well detailed it is. But if you look, when I turn it around, I want you to show, I want you to see the stitching at the side of the head. They had stitching at the side and stitching down the front of the head. But really the head is just like this big knob coming up from the torso. And that was a different technique also. Sometimes when they made the dolls, they would have the flat piece of uh, fabric and they would stitch it on a head form and then stitch that onto the torso. Other times the doll would be made um, with the head and the torso in one piece or even the head, the torso and the legs in one piece with just stitched on arms. But 
And she even has her two little later lithographed cloth dolls that she's playing with, which I think are funny because they're just about the basic same shape she is. I just love these dolls. I hope that's kind of coming through, and I just hope a lot of people appreciate them because this is this is our American history. This is this is like holding history in your hand. This wonderful little girl gave me a lot of pause because in many ways she's very, very similar to the Colombian doll that I'm going to be showing you later. But if you look at her construction, it's different. Now, does this mean it was a variation within the Colombian doll factory? Did it mean it was made from a pattern? Did it mean someone just saw one of these dolls and copied it? Very, very hard to tell, but again, Flat dimensional face, no shape to the face at all except a little curving around by the throat to make it slender. And then when I turn it around, you can see the stitching along the side, the stitching at the back of the head, and the stitching not down the center of the face, as some of them have the complete front center seam, but definition, a little bit of definition of the chin right here and a little definition of the crown, so it gives her face a little more. And then that beautifully, beautifully painted face with the shaded eyes, the well-defined nostrils and nose, just a wonderful doll. And again, one of the rarer sizes that they're hard, really hard to find in this small size. And speaking of small size, we have a very wonderful oil-painted black complexion doll in this small size. And I will turn it shortly so you can again see the shape of the head. You can see as I went along cataloging these dolls and examined them, the more I went into it, the more I, I really became fascinated with the construction details. And I was reminded that in the 1860s, when the French doll makers were starting to come out with their first commercial dolls, what did they care about more than anything? They cared about the bodies. They were trying to make a body that was durable, that was playable, that could be dressed and undressed and that would be a little bit realistic.